Hey, welcome to Nourishable. I'm Dr. Lara. In this mini lecture, we are going to dive into the dietary reference intakes or the DRIs. <laughs> Our goals in this lecture are to talk about the principles of the dietary reference intakes for macronutrients, and we'll also talk about how they are determined. Now I'm going to give you a forewarning. In this lecture, it's going to be some super intense alphabet soup, so be prepared. So let's talk a little bit about the history of the dietary reference intakes, or DRIs. These were first created in the United States back in the 1940s by the National Academies of Sciences. And what was going on at the time was World War II. And so there were a lot of American men who were um, going through military training, and it was found that a lot of them were def uh, deficient in nutrients. And so this really initiated the development of figuring out what are the, uh, uh, the appropriate amounts of nutrients that we need in order to aim for to make sure that our population it has a sufficient, healthy diet. Um, so these were these DRIs were originally focused on specifying requirements for the essential constituents of food that are important for health. So it was a very um, small, like, small focus, uh, not the big picture of dietary guidance. Um, and so these DRIs were meant to inform the dietary guidelines. The dietary guidelines are recommendations for the big picture of food and dietary patterns, whereas the DRIs are very specific to specific nutrients, vitamin C, vitamin A, carbohydrates, um, but not that whole picture. And of course, we eat food, we don't eat nutrients. Now, the DRIs have been set for all vitamins, minerals, macronutrients, electrolytes, and water. And the, this is very important. The DRIs vary with life stage and with gender. So there's going to be different DRIs, different values for these nutrients, depending on what life stage you're at, as well as what gender you are. And um, they apply to healthy people. So that's also kind of an important criteria is that um, the nutrient needs may be different if you have a particular disease, but these DRIs are all um, made uh, for healthy people. So let's take a look at what the, at the first um, type of uh, DRI, the first threshold or value, and which is called the Recommended Dietary Allowance, or RDA. Um, if we look back at the, uh, at the definition of the RDA from the book, uh, the RDA book back in 1989, it is the level of intake of essential nutrients that on the basis of scientific knowledge are judged by the Food and Nutrition Board to be adequate to meet the known nutrient needs of practically all healthy persons. So again, if we talk, take this historical perspective, the RDAs have been set um, starting in 1941 by the Food and Nutrition Board, which is a component of the National Academies of Sciences. And then every five years since 1941, they have gone back and reviewed the science to see if the RDAs need to be changed at all. And the idea at this time can really be represented by this gradient over here. We knew that there was a danger if you didn't consume enough of a particular nutrient, that you'd be in danger of deficiency. Um, but then, then they set an RDA level, a threshold of nutrient intake up here, where they said, okay, as long as you get this nutrient intake, you'll be in the safety zone. Anything this level or above will put you in the safety zone for that particular nutrient. So that we continue to see this same gradient here. Now, things started to change a little bit in the 1990s when we really realized that the situation is a bit more complicated than that. So this is our naive view, pre-1990s. But what we understood is that it's, it is more complicated than that, that yes, we do want to watch out for being deficient in a nutrient. But we were also really learning that there could be dangers of being of, of having too much nutrients. If you have too high uh, intake of a particular nutrient, you could be at danger of toxicity. So we really have to have this Goldilocks level in the middle for safety. We want to avoid deficiency. We also want to avoid toxicity. And so based on that, in the 1990s, they started developing other thresholds than just the RDA. So now what we're going to do is walk through what all of these different thresholds mean. And we're going to talk in terms of a population. <laughs> 
Okay, so to understand these DRIs in a little bit more detail, we're actually gonna draw a graph together to understand how they apply to populations. So this graph along the x-axis is observed level of nutrient intake. Low over here and high over here. This is just for a hypothetical nutrient. And then we have, two, this is a double y-axis axis graph. So over on this side, we have risk of inadequacy, which is gonna go from a probability of zero all the way up to a probability of 1.0. And then over on this other y-axis, we have our risk of adverse events, which we could also call our risk of toxicity. And so we're also gonna put some probability levels here. So zero, two, 1.0 and we'll put a 0.5 right there. Sorry, you can't see that super well. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the range of nutrient intakes. We'll make a kind of U-shaped curve that goes like this all the way down and then all the way back up again. Now, what we can see here is that across here at 50%, that level of nutrient intake where it is an adequate level for 50% uh, of people. So there's 50% of people who would no longer have inadequacy. That is what we call the EAR. So the estimated average requirement, EAR. And the EAR is going to meet the requirement for 50% of people. So we can see that it crosses the line right there at 50%. Next, let's take a look at where we would hit the needs for almost everybody, 97% to 98% of people. So that would be right here. So that is gonna be our RDA. So that is our recommended daily allowance. This is gonna be an intake level that is going to meet the needs for nearly all, 97 to 98% of people. And then you'll see that we have kind of this, in the U we have a, this kind of safety zone. And then just before the, sh the curve starts to go up again, that is where we're gonna set our UL, our upper limit. And this is the level of intake of a nutrient, the, this is the highest level of intake of a nutrient that is unlikely to cause any adverse events. Because we see after, when we, when we go higher than this level of nutrient intake, that that is when we start to increase our risk of adverse events, which we don't want to do. Now, in order to set these values, the EAR, the RDA, the UL, we need to have a specific measurement, like some characteristic that we are measuring. Um, now, for some nutrients, we may not have a, a specific measurement that is relevant for health. So we kind of, we just kind of have to guess, like what, what are the appropriate levels of intake? And so that is where the AI comes in. The AI is going to be when we don't have a specific measurement for this particular nutrient, but we can take a look at what kind of the average population tends to consume who seems to be healthy. And we can say, okay, that's, that's the amount in that, that particular nutrient that you need. That's an adequate intake. So that's kind of this range here, adequate intake. So just to reiterate what all of these different thresholds are, again, underneath the umbrella of the DRIs, so first we have the EAR, the estimated average requirement, and this is the level of nutrient intake that would meet the requirement for 50% of people within an age and gender uh, group. We then have the recommended dietary allowance or RDA, and that is the level that's gonna be the, meet the requirements for nearly all people in that age, uh, in that life, uh, in that uh, age range and, and gender group. So 97 to 98% of people. Now for some nutrients, we didn't have enough information in order to um, clarify a specific level. Perhaps we didn't have an appropriate health measure to determine the exact uh, nutrient intake required. So instead, those nutrients have an adequate intake or an AI. And the AI is a range that's based on observational data of healthy people where we don't have more specific measures. So it's essentially saying, look, healthy people tend to consume this range. That seems good. Um, then we have the upper level, sometimes also referred to as the tolerable upper limit. And this is the level of nutrient where anything higher than where, or this is the highest level of nutrient where any, where you're unlikely to have any 
um, adverse effects or symptoms of toxicity. You don't want to be aiming to get to the upper level. Um, you just want to make sure that you want to make sure that you are below that upper level for the nutrient. Now there are a few other um, standards underneath the DRI that we haven't talked about yet in our graph. So the first of them is the estimated energy requirements or EERs. These are especially relevant for us in our macronutrients course. So the EERs are gonna be the average energy intake to maintain energy balance in a healthy individual of a defined age, gender, weight, height, and level of physical activity. And then finally, very relevant for us are the acceptable macronutrients nutrient distribution ranges or AMDRs. We'll, we'll define those in more detail in a slide or two. And then we have a brand new category that's part of the expanded standards of the DRIs. So we have one more combination to add to our alphabet soup, which is the chronic disease risk reduction or CDRR. And the CDRR characterizes nutrient intakes that are expected to reduce the risk of developing a chronic disease. So, so far, only two uh, nutrients have been kind of evaluated um, within this lens of a CDRR, and those are sodium and potassium. Um, they have set a CDRR for sodium um, at levels that uh, reduce the risk of developing cardiovascular disease and hypertension, whereas there wasn't enough data available to set a CDRR for potassium. So I think this is something where we can stay tuned to see how um, in the next several years or perhaps decades, whether there are more CDRRs that are developed for other nutrients. Okay, so let's dig into the RDAs and adequate intakes for macronutrients in a little bit more detail. Um, so in this chart, I'm going, I have kind of just a general adult female over here, adult male over here, and then different macronutrients listed down here. And I just wanna point your attention to this, that um, the asterisk indicates that this value is an adequate intake, whereas if there's no asterisk, then it is an RDA. So we see that uh, carbohydrate has an RDA, 130 grams per day for both men and women. And the RDA for carbohydrate is set at 130 grams because this is based on the average minimum amount of glucose utilized by the brain. So this is the amount of carbohydrate that you need to provide for your body so that you can your brain constantly has a supply of glucose for its chosen fuel. So that's where the RDA for carbohydrate comes from. Um, the next that we have is we have adequate intakes for fiber. The adequate intake for fiber of females is 25 grams per day. For males, it's 38 grams per day. And this is an adequate intake that was set based on the intake level that's observed to decrease the risk of coronary heart disease. Now next, you will see we come to fat and you'll see we actually don't have an RDA or an AI for fat. And that is because they're in 2005, which was the last time that the DRIs for um, macronutrients were assessed, that there was insufficient data to determine a really defined level of total fat intake at which there was um, risk of inadequacy or prevention of chronic disease was occurring. So stay tuned, maybe um, when these are updated, perhaps the next few years, there might be something for fat. But for, net, for right now, there's no RDA or AI for total fat. However, we do have, oops. However, we do have AIs for our essential fats. And so those again are the omega-6 linoleic acid, um, which is 12 grams per day and 17 grams per day. And then um, we also have an AI set for alpha linolenic acid. That's an omega-3 fatty acid that is the precursor for EPA and DHA. So we see that we have a lower adequate intake level set for females and males for that. So I alluded to this category of DRIs earlier, the acceptable macronutrient distribution range or AMDR. The definition of the AMDR is a range that represents intakes that are associated with a reduced risk of chronic disease, intakes that will provide all the essential dietary nutrients that can be consumed at uh, specific sufficient levels, as well as intakes that are based on adequate energy intake and physical activity in order to maintain energy balance. So these a AMDRs are really set to be maintaining energy balance rather than um, specifically losing weight or gaining weight. Now the AMDRs are gonna be expressed as a percentage of total energy intake. 
and, uh, and again, they are ranges. So this is kind of different from the RDAs and the AIs, which were really set values. Um, the AMDRs are ranges. And the AMDR for a carbohydrate is 45 to 65% of energy. The AMDR for fat is 20 to 35% of energy. And then finally, the AMDR for protein is 10 to 35% of energy. The way that we got to these AMDRs is through both interventional studies as well as through some observational or epidemiological studies. And most of these were actually um, looking at studies that had different proportions of carbohydrates and fats and then looking at how that altered disease risk. So um, the carbohydrate and fat they were, uh, these were looking at studies where they found that very, very low fat, high carbohydrate diets were increasing the risk of coronary heart disease, whereas diets that were very high in fat were increasing the risk of obesity and all of the other comorbidities that are associated with obesity. So that's how they determined these ranges for carbohydrate and fat. And then the range for protein was just kind of fit in after that. Um, and but while making sure that still this range of protein here still allows for getting all the essential dietary nutrients um, and maintaining energy balance so that it all works together. The, so the, one of the interesting things about these AMDRs is that changing one is going to automatically uh, change some of the others. So for example, if you reduce the amount of energy that's coming from carbohydrate in your diet, that's automatically going to be either increasing the, the proportion of energy that's coming from fat or the proportion of energy that's coming from protein. So they're all related to each other. The other thing that I wanted to point out in here as well, not specifically AMDRs, but just um, also values that are represented in as a proportion of energy are um, that in the 2015 dietary guidelines for the first time, and then this was um, maintained in the 2020 dietary guidelines, is there was a cap put on added sugar intake. So the cap of added sugar is meant to be 10% of total energy. The goal is to consume less than 10% of total energy as added sugar. And then same thing with um, saturated fat. So uh, then 2015, in the 2015 dietary guidelines and then kind of maintained in the 2020 dietary guidelines is this capping saturated fat intake at 10% of total energy. Um, you will also see that uh, our, our two categories of essential fats have, um, they have specific energy intakes that are required as well. So the AMDR for linoleic acid, that's our omega-6 fatty acid, um, is between five to 10% of energy. And then for alpha linolenic acid is between 0.6 to 1.2% of total energy. So these are the AMDRs, which tend to be tend to be a way that people talk about their overall diets a little bit more frequently. Now there are many different ways that we can use these DR, DRIs um, to promote health. So one way is through nutrition monitoring. So now that we have these different thresholds to determine um, an adequate intake, to determine um, whether we expect 50% of the population or nearly all of the population at a particular life stage to be consuming enough nutrient, we can use that in terms of nutrition monitoring and get a sense of how well is our population doing. So for example, we know that the AI for fiber is 25 grams for females, 38 grams for adult males, and in general, General, Americans are eating about half that. So we need really need to do better to get up um, to try and hit that adequate intake for fiber. The DRIs are also used to help inform the dietary guidelines. So the dietary guidelines are our more food-based recommendations for how to eat. And of course, we, we tend to think about eating in terms of food and dietary patterns overall as opposed to individual nutrients. But when they're forming the dietary guidelines, they have to make sure that these food-based recommendations are fulfilling all of the needs of the D that are laid out in the thresholds of the DRIs. Um, and then the other thing that we have talked about that we will talk about today during our first class is nutrition labeling. So we use these thresholds de uh, determined by the DRIs in order to help label foods and help consu give consumers information to get a sense of how is this food contributing to my dietary intake for particular nutrients. And that wraps up our little mini lecture on the DRIs.